All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Decker, um, and I'm a political science professor. And this is a talk that's being sponsored by, um, let's see if I can get this right, the Department of Political Science, the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences, and the MGA chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the political science honorary. A little, a little background about this guy. I've known Don for over three decades, which means um, you know, we were zygotes when we knew each other, uh, <laughs> obviously. Um, and uh, he has a bachelor's degree in public relations from the University of Florida and a master's degree in political communications from Georgia State. And uh, I didn't really know that he was going to become somebody that was well known, so he's kind of my brush with greatness, I guess. Um, and I don't want to tell too much about the story because I don't want to steal his thunder, so. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Don Diaz Johnston and take it away, Don. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Well, uh, as I said, I'm Don Diaz Johnston, and uh, today we're going to talk on marriage equality, specifically the Florida campaign. But first, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of the history that gets us here, then we're going to move into Florida, and as I promised Dr. Decker, we're going to get some real behind the scenes stuff of what actually went on and how the process, it, the political process actually worked. Now, so we go all the way back, the Stonewall Riots, for those of you that don't know, this is what's known as the beginning of the gay rights movement. Some people say the modern gay rights movement, they didn't exist for them. June 28, 1969, Greenwich Village, New York City. The, the Stonewall Inn, the Stonewall Bar, is still actually there. It's on the National Historic Register. It used to be illegal in the uh, city and state of New York for people of the same sex to dance together. So every once in a while, the police would go down to a not really gay bar, and they would uh, uh, arrest, publish people's names in the newspaper, carry on. Well, not that night. A bunch of drag queens got pissed, and they kicked the crap out of the police. It riots for five days. This is the modern gay rights movement. This is the first time anywhere that gays actually fought back. And yes, it does go on for riots for five days. Um, back here. Now this one, I told you it was June 28, 1969. Here we are, and we're actually starting. This picture is taken in May 1970. As a result of Stonewall, these two guys who live in Minneapolis say, You know, honey, let's go get married. So they go down to the clerk's office expecting to be turned down, but they try and get a marriage license in Hennepin County. They're turned down. It actually becomes what will be Supreme Court precedent, Baker versus Nelson. One of the things I didn't even know until I was researching this. They also, a few months later, went to neighboring Blue Lake County. They did give them a license. They did get married. They're still married today. This is the first recorded gay marriage of any same-sex couple <coughs> in the world. This is what actually starts. This is the first iteration of the gay rights movement. It's called the Gay Liberation Front. This actually goes around the world. Within a few months of Stonewall, the Gay Liberation Front begins popping up in England and other places around the world. I cannot impress upon you how incredibly tiny, unimportant, radical it was at the time, but the reason why I go this far back is the Gay Liberation Front was actually openly against same-sex marriage at the time. It was a horrible idea. They thought it was bad. Why? Because they got their name from the Women's Liberation Movement. Now, the simple idea here we've got is gay liberation marking women's liberation. At the time, these women were, marriage was horrible. <laughs> and the laws so strongly favored the men, some women couldn't own property, they couldn't independently get the mortgage, couldn't be put on. There were a lot of legal barriers to keep women sort of tied to men. This is why the idea was so abhorrent to same-sex couples because marriage within the left was a horrible thing we needed to abolish almost. It was a radical idea that it wasn't there. Bonus point, if any of your professors out there can recognize the picture of what the New York Times called the hat that roared. 
<laughs> there you go. Now, this is actually a little bit of a prologue I want to tell you. It's a movie called The Day It Snowed in Miami. My husband George and actually briefly appear in it. We didn't know we actually were sitting in the audience for the premiere. Go, that's awesome. <laughs> um, anybody know what the, uh, the significance? It only snows in Miami one time in recorded history. It's very fun when it does that. I'm going to come to one lane. This woman, Ruth Shack. And it says, she actually in, let's see, get the right date here. January 18th, 1977. She is a member of the Miami-Dade County Commission. On that day, they pass the nation's first gay civil rights law. It's a non-discrimination ordinance only in what was then known as Dade County. It's now Miami-Dade County. And so if you were in metropolitan Miami, you could not be fired for being gay. This lady did not like that. <laughs> and what actually happens is the next day, it actually snowed. Some people actually would joke and say, wow, hell froze over. <laughs> Hot as Miami is, you give gay rights in this house. Now, Anita actually lived in Miami. She was the spokesperson. Oops, sorry, Ooh, I the wrong button. Um, she, here, she's the spokesperson for Florida Orange Juice. She's uh, a popular singer. She was a runner-up, I think third or fourth for Miss America. She was Miss Oklahoma. Um, uh, and a popular singer, uh, particularly from a Christian bench. She attended church and the pastor that Sunday announced what had happened. And she was so incensed and so upset, somebody needs to do something. And she decided, and she actually gets uh, something started called the Save Our Children campaign. And that was considered a very nasty campaign, um, mostly because it was uh, linking uh, gays with pedophilia um, and making it so. Now, if you're wondering, if you don't know, why has she got a pie on her face? It is a very, very famous clip of her doing a news conference. And a guy, guy by the name of Bob Kunst got so pissed smacks her in the face with a pie on live television. <laughs> she almost came out a victim in that, but one of the things that actually comes as a result of this famous line, and I, I remember this when it comes time for us to go, is says, don't have an Anita moment. She is truly a victim. That was horrible that Bob did that. But she quips right after, well, at least it was a fruit pie came across as horribly nasty and hinted that there really was some bigotry behind this. So that's what happens with them. And as I said, um, it does snow. Successfully, what does Anita do? She actually gets the ordinance repealed. The Florida legislature actually goes in and passes two bills immediately thereafter as a result of the Save Our Children campaign. One is they ban, uh, Florida's the only uh, state that ban gay couples from adopting children. The other one was Florida passed a ban on gay marriage, which other than those two guys in Minneapolis was not a thing. But actually, what, Florida's the second one, Maryland had done it right before that. And it was directly as a result of those two guys in Minneapolis. So this is years later. So what happens in the interim? Eight. Immediately following this period, the gay rights community switches, and, the, and all of the attention then moves to AIDS, which I'm sure everyone understands. But the key things I want you to take away from that decade of the 80s, opposition to marriage within the gay community dissolves to almost nothing. Monogamy becomes much more popular and much more important. The gay community was split on that, but the impact of promiscuity, now these are all debates going on, I'm not gonna go into the, but getting there. It also does something incredibly important. Two big things come out of it. It creates a nationwide activist uh, network for lesbian and gay people. It also creates the fundraising, specifically the other thing, is it begins to create sympathy for gay people. Whereas, as Anita said, we were pretty much seen, generally accepted, same as pedophile. Now, 
enter these three jokers. You might recognize one of the, the, the names for this. Okay. This guy, George Mersuli, up in the top, he's a good friend of mine. <coughs> he actually comes along in the 90s. And he runs a campaign to undo what Anita did. Now, actually, he never tells anything. It's only in the last couple of years that George has actually come out and said, he explains, he was actually fired as a result of the law that Anita, by taking it back, he was allowed to be fired. He didn't tell anyone there. But that's actually what happens is he loses his job and he gets involved in this. He was just a guy with a job in corporate America. And he actually becomes, now he is one of the most influential uh, lobbyists and organizers in the nation. Uh, President Biden shortlisted him. He was one of the three people that were going to be running his Hispanic organizing for the last presidential campaign. That's where he got to. Oh, look at Joker here, you see, this is Manny Diaz. That's actually my brother-in-law. And that's my husband, George Diaz. So what happens is, uh, Mersuli actually gets Anita Bryant's thing. It takes five years to get the Dade County Commission to reinstate the original, and they call it a human rights ordinance. Now, one of these guys come in, how does this fit? They get it done. The very next thing they do is they uh, start a petition drive because they knew popular will is going to be against this. We're going to play the pedophile card again. It works. It really does. Let's play it. Except these two doctors. Why do I say that? These guys, so Mersuli knew George. And George actually helped with Save Day. It was Safeguarding American Values for Everyone. That's Save. And Mersuli is the head of Save. And during those five years, they actually organized, fundraised, did all kinds of things, and became a political force within Miami. So only the greater Miami area. That's where they operate. This guy decides that he wants to run for mayor of Miami. Up until that point, he had just been a real estate attorney that had done rather well. And he was well known for one other thing. Um, and you don't even know. Elian Gonzalez's lead attorney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was our, now these guys actually laugh about that one going, okay, that's a reason to like be famous and stuff, but you're never going to get mayor. It's a joke. But because of the fact that Mersuli and George are here, save day because of this guy, knowing this guy, endorses this guy, and it's the first endorsement he gets in a jungle primary for the Miami mayor, because our last mayor had gone out spectacularly and embarrassingly getting national headlines. Um, it's when they start actually pelting City Hall with bananas to say it's Banana Republic. Not too far off. I do love my adopted home, but not too far off. So Manny comes in and they just see him as an absurd, it's like eight people running. He actually makes the runoff. And everybody took him seriously because he actually did get an endorsement and save was nothing to sniff at. So that actually happens. Why do I mention all this? Well, we go back to the petition to repeal again. You know, and neither repeals at once, repeal again. It's an old expression love coined by the late great Molly Ivins. In politics, you gotta dance with the one what brung you. <laughs> and that means that whoever helped get you elected, especially the ones who went in first with money or influence, those are the ones you've got to pay back. Manny actually wins. He defeats a very popular uh, former mayor who comes back out of retirement to run again. He, uh, and it's sort of a, a lucky thing. Right after he gets in, they announce the petition drive. This guy calls and says, payback time. What I'm saying with this is they were looking at a situation in which they were expecting a tsunami and then it was going to be Anita all over again. What particularly happens in this role now, uh, Miami is dr dramatically Hispanic, significantly Hispanic, <clears throat> and so you've got a whole cultural thing. Manny cuts a Spanish language radio ad <clears throat> talking about his brother George, who is gay, 
and likens it, which is key to the Catholic thing, it's about family. You don't abandon family. You stand behind family. He goes through all this. Why don't I mention all this? It's going to lay the groundwork. Mercilli tells me they did before and after. That radio ad moves 10 points. That is a huge jump in a matter of weeks in public opinion. Moves at 10 points. Ultimately, the petition drive fails, and the law still stands on the book today as a result of that. But what that does is sets the stage for where we're going with marriage equality. Now, we're actually to the marriage equality part. These are the different players. I'll actually break down who they are, but these are the key people in the lawsuit. Um, I'll back up. Uh, in 2004, Florida, like everybody else, passes a uh, constitutional amendment to their state constitution banning gay marriage. So this guy, Evan Wolfson, he wrote a Harvard Law thesis on same-sex marriage. It was literally a strategy, a 50-state strategy. Here's how you do it. Here's how it's done. His Harvard professor said, Brilliant, but that's a joke. You're never going to see it in your lifetime. Get out of here. Um, uh, so it does, it's not well received at all. Um, but he believed in it. He actually worked for Lambda Legal, which was uh, a, still is a gay rights law organization. It'd be like the ACLU for same-sex couples. He works on the Baker uh, Mikey case, which is one of the first uh, Hawaii cases. He works on the Baker Vermont Civil Unions case. And he is generally considered the architect of the same-sex marriage movement. Now, enter this lady, Kate Kendall. She is the, uh, was the executive director at the time of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. This is a massive organization that actually um, works for gays, lesbians, trans, the entire LGBTQ community. Uh, she is absolutely a riot, and we'll make sure. <coughs> she, she looks really nice here, I found these photos, but whenever I met her, she was wearing a big plaid suit, she loved to add bowling shoes, all this weird stuff. Very funky lady, very funny, um, very entertaining. Now, this is our lead counsel in the case. He uh, went to Cornell Law School, has even uh, recruited and screened candidates to work in the Obama White House. He's also transgender. Shannon actually uh, was born a girl. And yeah, that is his real facial hair. Um, I never would have known. I actually had to stop class. Um, but yes, and he actually worked. One of the comments he makes uh, at one point <coughs> was he was shocked that um, he could get married as a transgender man, but his lesbian sister could not. And he said, how perverse is the law? Because once he became recognized as a man, he could actually get married. Whereas his sister says, and she'd been in a longer relationship than I have. Now, these two, Nadine Smith and Stratton Pollitzer, they, and they still are, the co-directors of Equality Florida, they lead the campaign. And by lead the campaign, Equality Florida is out front. Um, NCLR brings in national money, national legal expertise as part of the strategy. These guys run what we call the ground game. And we'll get more specifically into the ground game. That's where I come in. That's where some is there. But the idea is it's a public relations or a persuasion campaign. That's actually what they do. Um, and they're, they're connected throughout the state. Now, Elizabeth Schwartz, she'll come in as well. She is uh, a nationally recognized family law attorney, specifically on LGBT uh, issues. Um, and as I said, she published legal papers in the Cambridge University Press, American Bar Association journals. She's been on the cutting edge and handled some cases that you've seen nationally in which you'll have custody cases. One of them was a Vermont couple, and she was like, that they're, these two women get a civil union in Vermont, go back home to Florida. There is no gay marriage recognition yet. They split apart, they have a kid. It's not, it's very acrimonious. She actually litigates 
who gets custody, because one of them actually takes the child out of the country to get away from. And divorce can get ugly. And so um, she actually worked on these issues and was um, actually telling people, please do not go to another state. I, it sounds wonderful to get it, because Florida had no similar law, so they could not dissolve it. Like you can, if you move from other, so it couldn't be. They had to establish residency back in Vermont to actually do this. It, it was a mess. And so she's actually an expert. She also knew, and this is going to be very important, the inside of Miami judiciary, the lay of the land, people that are there. Ah, every story has to have a villain, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pam Bondi used to be the Attorney General of Florida. I love to always say that she was divorced twice. <laughs> And she engaged in a third commitment ceremony in the Caribbean with no legal weight. We used to say, they're going, really? You won't let us? And you're, anyway. Um, now, what's interesting in this story, uh, I'd like to mention, eventually when we get uh, toward the end of the show, see, she was the last Republican Attorney General that continued to fight this after it was so incredibly clear that it was lost. Uh, that was, uh, everyone expected at the time that that was because she uh, had future aspirations. So far, none of those have panned out, um, although uh, she has played some minor roles in fundraising with the Trump administration and other things, but for the most part, she's faded out of public life. Uh, she may yet come back. Um, yeah, this guy. Mm -hmm. Actually, I met him. He was a hoot. Um, and I genuinely mean that. <laughs> he shows up for our hearing in person. So he's the Liberty University, or was the law school dean, and this was at the time this goes on. We're talking about the 2014. He actually argued in our case against same-sex marriage. And before the court, he cites the fall of Rome, <laughs> and that homosexuality is akin to drug abuse. It's a long rambling. The judge is just standing there. She almost cuts him off, but she wants to give him an opportunity to speak. And that I do actually admire about our American court system is we don't actually judge whether or not we think your speech is all that. We're going, you're going to get hurt. And he's one of the ones. Pam did not even show up to argue or have anybody actually argue. They just submitted papers and let it go. We'll it. Okay, here we are. Probably gonna have a hard time recognizing me because I don't have that hair. There I am. Right next to George. Say <laughs> so you get the one. So these are actually the plaintiffs. This is the last of the players that I'm gonna show you guys. Um, let's see if I can do this right. Kathy, Carla. Vanessa, Melanie, no, Melanie, Vanessa, David, Juan Carlos, George, me, Jeff, Todd, Summer, and Pam. Now, they were actually, um, we were actually hit, there was a, uh, for months, there was a search going on to find what they considered the ideal couple for this. Um, all of the couples that you see here, uh, except George and I, have children. Um, uh, generally speaking, slightly more attractive. These two, Summer and Pam, are uh, grandmothers. And they actually care for a special needs grandson um, in that. So these were part of the ones. But you can also see there's a certain degree of central casting kind of going on <laughs> with the group. So you've got a, oops, sorry. Oops. You've got an interracial couple, you've got an older, nice white lady couple, another two mixed Hispanic white, two Hispanic girls, and an extremely white <laughs> couple of girls. Now, as uh, others have, when we talk about uh, photogenic, uh, George and I actually nicknamed uh, Vanessa and Melanie uh, uh, Posh and Sporty Spice. <laughs> because they actually do kind of look like they might have been the Spice Girls or whatever. Um, Ultimately, Kathy here, this is Kathy Pareto. She will be the lead plaintiff. They actually, there was a whole thing to decide to do that. So anyway, they're all screened. George and I are not a part of that screening process. That comes later. 
Where do we come in? Okay, so my brief brush, brush with history. So, George and I are dating. Goes on for a year. I actually proposed to him, get engaged. And we have no idea that there's been this big push to get couples for several months. And they, they interviewed thousands of couples. He's talking to me one Sunday night. This is like within a week of getting engaged. And he says, Don, we should sue to get the right of gay marriage. And at first I'm thinking, that's crazy. He says, well, it's not like we don't know enough attorneys. I mean, I actually work for a boutique appellate firm. It's about, like, yeah, we, we know nothing but attorneys. And we actually, and so he starts hatching this idea. He's talking about it. We should do this. We might, but, but then he says, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. We should call this guy. <laughs> and so he calls George Mersuli and he says, hey, George, we're thinking about it. But Don says, you know, maybe somebody else is doing this and we don't have to. And George says, I don't know. You'd think somebody would, but I'm not really like plugged in. He says, I don't know, maybe we'll call Evan or we'll call Liz. They're bound to know. Now, actually, I've spoken to Evan during uh, my reporter day, so I actually knew Evan. But this guy actually has these two people on, on speed dial on his uh, phone. And so he actually calls Liz first. And once again, it's Sunday night. Everybody's like, and says, hey, Liz, do you know anything? And she goes, are you kidding? I've been working on this thing for months. We launched. There's going to be a uh, there's going to be an announcement and a uh, press conference in a week. And George says, "Well, let me let me conference George in and get the one." And so all of a sudden, Liz and Mersuli and George are on. The, actually, I'm on speaker as well. And Liz and she goes, "Oh my God! Wait, what? You guys want to be in on this too?" And Liz starts freaking out because, as I said, um, uh, George was actually extremely well known as the gay brother of the mayor who actually goes on and is very successful with this. First thing out of Liz's mouth is, these two are a get. Are you ready? We're going to get this now. Um, oh, by the way, this is Manny again. Why were we a get? See who he's standing next to, don't you? Anybody recognize this? That's Michael Bloomberg. So uh, Manny's on his foundation. They pal around, do a lot of things. One of the first things they were thinking is, that's a lot of money we could get. It's a lot of fundraising. So it wasn't, it wasn't entirely altruistic. So anyway, Liz says, OK, are you guys ready? She actually calls Shannon over in San Francisco and says, we got to open this up, see whether or not we can get them in there. But we actually have to be vetted. So there's a legal process that you go through to make sure that they don't really regret that they picked us. And we actually jump in and join it. Um, now, getting the plan. So that's how we join. I'll come, I'll circle back a little bit. Anybody have any idea what these seven states have in common? Uh, yeah, uh, that, that would be, there, there are, uh, red. Okay, I told you NCLR, which was uh, uh, run by Kate, and the, and the head legal counsel, Shannon Minter. They are based in San Francisco, and Kate says, okay, we're doing a nationwide campaign. We're going to push it up, because during this period, I'm not going to get too much into this, there's back and forth with like California has marriage, then there's a petition to overturn it. Hawaii's going on over here. Vermont's <coughs> got something over there. Uh, the civil unions. Massachusetts, it becomes, you know, it all just rolls into all kinds of patchwork crazy. Kate says, I want you to come up with a plan, talking with Evan Wilson, Wolfson, um, whether or not we can, how we're going to push this, all 50 states.
Dakota, Idaho, Tennessee, Wyoming, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Kate joked about this on the campaign trail when we were doing it. She says, when Shannon got done saying that, I immediately thought to myself, we need a drug workplace policy. Because you've got to be out of your freaking mind if you pick these seven states. But that's actually what they did. They were very careful in deciding which states they wanted. And uh, so there was a different strategy for each state. But they said, these are the ones that are actually going to be the most favorable to us. Florida's legal strategy. Specifically, first thing they do, if you're going to do something like this, you need to line up your allies and either get them in or get them out before anything's announced. So they invite the ACLU and Save Dade, who I've mentioned before, that was what Marsilia had done, and they're still around Miami, and they're going to be filing it in Miami-Dade State Court. That is what they determine in Florida, not federal court, state court. Um, they're going to file it there. They were adamant, and they explained this to us, the plaintiff's couples, because we're going to be the front line of this. An appeal, it says, it was not going to be terribly likely. Like, we could pull a really bad judge in federal court. There's also the possibility that the attorney general would pull it and bring it into the northern district of Florida, which they were expecting. You know, it was not going to be a favorable court based on the judges that were actually sitting at the time. And they were terrified that it would go and be appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal in Atlanta, which, um, for those who are not that familiar, the 9th Circuit in San Francisco is considered the most liberal. The 11th Circuit is generally considered the most conservative. And so if there was going to be a bad precedent that could split it, they wanted to get out of there. So that's where they come in. Now, what were we supposed to do? Um, our role as these six couples, we were supposed to put a human face to a legal situation. We were warned, we went through media training, you do not discuss your legal rights in any of these things. If they ask you, you turn, you pivot, and you talk about why you want to get married. Talk about your love and commitment. Share your personal experiences. Share your stories. Big key, this is um, uh, part of the camp, love wins. And that was over and over drilled into us to talk about it as love wins rather than a political thing. Um, why are we actually doing media? Why are we supposed to go out and do this? If you're all familiar, Roe versus Wade. If you uh, 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 support abortion rights, you're thrilled with it. But one of the things that uh, both groups learn, both sides of that debate learned, yeah, without a media campaign going along to a court campaign, courts, number one, uh, or even more, especially post Roe v. Wade, less likely to go out on a limb for a not without a lot of public support to begin with. Yeah. The second thing is you also create an endless back and forth and back and forth, as Dr. Dr. Systems Theory will teach you every day in his class. So our job, remember like I said, Manny cuts that radio ad, was to move the needle. Here we are at the press conference. Um, one thing I need to do. Some people say you better be short here. Um, and Shannon is over here on the end. He actually comes in from San Francisco for this. Um, media Blitz. Right. We had no idea what we were in for. So, here's George and I again. These are the couples we talked about. It. Uh, George and I knew that we were uh, brought in. His brother uh, was the mayor of Miami. As I said, that would get a certain degree of attention. My grandfather and father were actually in North Florida in Tallahassee. Old families, well known, uh, well respected. And so we're actually, we were the political couple. We were the only childless couple. But our job actually, and that's why Liz has jumped in, we think they might garner a little more attention. We had no idea what we were getting into. Um, 
This, these pictures, this is actually January 21st, 2014. By the way, I, I, I proposed to George on New Year's Day. 20 days later, here we are. <laughs> um, throughout this whole day, I'm thinking to myself, what have we done? <laughs> Not such a good idea. Yeah, media blitz. It doesn't even begin to get it. So we're on ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, YouTube. It viral was already a thing, I think. But yeah, it, it kind of goes viral. You can see the different couples. Let's keep going. We were on the front page of every paper in the state of Florida that day. When I said the media actually zeroed in, one of the things that happened, uh, and it was personally, it was, it was frankly disturbing for George and I both. When all the couples actually get there, um, so it's a room like this. Imagine George and I, everybody just basically turns and is talking to George and the guy standing next to him. Um, uh, they, the Miami Herald does a spread. We like draw all of the attention away. And I say that um, uh, not, it's not all that exciting or thrilling, but that was our job, which we didn't actually realize, is to create a sense of occasion, excitement, dramatic. These are professional photos done by professional photographers, some of the other ones. Uh, this one appears in the Sun Sentinel. That's actually their photographer. These two are done by Courtney Ortiz, or these three are done by Courtney Ortiz. One of the other things I want to say to you, if you see these four couples, this one, the other two couples actually almost drop out completely from the media. Uh, one summer uh, actually gets some serious blowback, even though she had uh, cleared it with work, that some of their customers where she worked were very upset that she was involved, and she said, I hate to do this, but it, it, they're, gonna, they're, they're trying to ruin me. International media. One of the things that's not actually realized about the Florida couples, uh, our PR firm actually did international media. Uh, the number one English-speaking television station in Miami is number four in ratings. The top three actually are in Spanish. So we had to do Spanish language. If you're going to get that, it would be throughout Florida. But it actually carries throughout the entire United States, as well as Central and South America. I actually, uh, this is not one I didn't find a photo here. George does a round table. Now, you think you get there. He was never formally trained in Spanish. He just grew up speaking Spanish around the house. He was actually telling me before he appears in this round table, I have the vocabulary of a third grader. That is an eight-year-old. He's basically going on this debate show. There's another one that I actually do with him, which I learned Spanish in North Florida. <laughs> I did take three years, and so I did okay, but it was a little bit of a Spanglish one. I actually did a live television program. We did that. I made the horrible mistake of asking, well, how many people watch this show? Every day? As I'm headed out like four minutes before you sit on the couch in live television, and she replied, 30 million. <laughs> I want to put in perspective for you, because it's all through Spain, Central, South America, all of the United States. Do you know how many people watch Fox News in an entire 24-hour period? Between two and a half and three million. I didn't know no Spanish. <laughs> but it was a little bit of nerve-wracking, it was fun. And what I say with that one is, this is actually a car, and you can see Juan Carlos actually does, he is one of the other girls. He does this one, one interview. He's a doctor, he had a really hard time making it. He was frankly on call in some of the situations that come in. So actually, these guys go and they do talk. And Juan Carlos, George, Juan Carlos sang my butt once uh, in the middle of the thing. So they got because he was a native speaker and he is a medical doctor. Um, but the point was, the Florida campaign actually has national and international impacts, even though the media was to focus on Florida. So it actually moves the needle. Oh, sorry moves the needle broadly. We actually moved, during the period of this campaign, the needle moves 15 points. That's a result of this, and that's one of the lasting things about this, is it also begins. 
some complexities, but we're actually having impact in Central and South America. Actually, I should say my husband uh, had an impact doing that. Um, and of course, we had to take our picture in front of the CNN Latino Miami. Truth is, CNN Latino had actually already closed, but it was still in the studio, and I don't know if I bother to take it down. <laughs> but it was in Univision. Remember how I told you? Do not file in federal court. And hey, ACLU and Save Day, do you want to join? Because of the media blitz and all of the attention we're getting, three weeks after we do, they run out and go, damn it, that's a lot of attention. <laughs> So they round up the first gay people they can grab a hold of. That they, they're literally actually board members and people that volunteer. And they go, do you guys want to sue? And they literally do sue. And they file in the Northern District of Florida. If you ever really wonder what really goes on in time, jealousy, pettiness, because as I said, they were invited, asked to come. <laughs> no, thanks, y'all do it. It's, it. We've got other stuff going on. They didn't really actually expect that kind of attention and the kind of fundraising that was coming as a result of it. So um, they filed this. We immediately have an emergency conference call with all of the plaintiff's couples. You guys need to be brief because we, and we would get briefings periodically as things went on. The official line is, despite this being recorded, this is wonderful. We're so thrilled that they would come and join us. And the more, the merrier. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, they're going, <laughs> Just, you're going to screw it up. Years of planning. So we actually do the campaign. And this is it. We're actually, <coughs> this one makes me laugh. So George is 47 here. This is, we're actually uh, in a gay pride parade. First time you ever went to a gay pride parade in his entire life. Uh, of course, I also love to tease him, so he wraps himself in the rainbow flag, which he thought was cool, and I said, you're like some sort of gay superhero. <laughs> <laughs> what we did, um, as you can see, these are the stars. Now, all the couples did this stuff. This is not just us, some of the specific uh, statewide fundraising. We actually appeared at events and did statewide fundraising. The six stars that you see are the, uh, the ones that George and I attended. So we zigzagged all over the state. Most everybody else stayed in South Florida. Some did come actually to the Central Florida. The only ones we missed were Tampa and Orlando because we was tired. In that year, we did more than 50 media appearances. It does move public opinion 15%. Uh, and as I said, this is a funny thing I did not expect. Quality Florida couples dominate nationwide media coverage. Remember how I told you there's seven states going on, all this other stuff? Shannon Mentor tells us, and frankly, I think it was Sporty and Posh Spice. Just my personal. Mm -hmm. Although Kathy Pareto, we, are, we had gorgeous lesbians in this. Shannon actually says they keep getting media calls, keep getting media calls. Remember, they're running them in seven different states. They keep asking for the Florida couples, and uh, finally, and Shannon's just like, um, you know, we got these other people. They're and so, they're so telegenic and they actually speak so well. We'd really like, and, and like I said, Vanessa and Melanie got way more than we did, especially with the nationals. Um, one reporter actually said, did you hire professional actors to pretend to be these couples? Um, and I said, if, you, if you're wanting to scroll back, they actually believed that. And Shannon's, uh, his response was, have you ever been to South Florida? <laughs> Those people actually look like that. He says, that's why I spend as little time as possible there. <laughs> So here we are actually at the hearing. The case itself was actually very simple. Um, uh, it was a summary judgment. I won't speak here, I'm going to tad longer than I expected. But it's a summary judgment, uh, and there is a single hearing. This takes place on May 1st. Remember, we kick it off with actually filing, and then uh, May 1st. Actually, we have to be denied a, a, a license. We go on the 20th, we get denied a license. Then we file on the 21st. And May 1st, the judge schedules the summary judgment hearing. That's where Matt Staber goes into all the uh, rambling and ranting about the fall of Rome and all of these horrible things that are happening. Curiously, though, the hearing is actually held in a famous courtroom where they once held the trial of Al Capone. So it's actually known as the Al Capone courtroom. 
Uh, it's actually very gorgeous. You'll see some pictures of uh, it in there. But um, here we are on the front steps. I don't know where, uh, Quality Florida keeps bringing out, so there were people coming out uh, to have protest signs doing all these things as we go along. We do the hearing. While we're waiting for the hearing, before the ruling, because the ruling takes a few months. I cannot impress upon you, it seems so obvious now, people saw it, but here I am on the inside, we're getting constant feedback, we're doing more press things, they're actually creating reasons for us to go out. And every time a court case, because throughout 2014, different court cases are coming out in different jurisdictions, that are beginning, to, and dominoes are beginning to fall. Uh, we don't realize it, but it's a tsunami. It's a legal tsunami for gay rights and uh, uh, same-sex marriage, as you will. What's actually happening on the inside, after 20 to 30 years of absolute stonewall opposition, support creating statewide constitutional bans, Equality Florida and NCLR start getting calls from all the major opposition groups. Hey, how about civil unions? Y'all wanted that a while back. We could, let's do something like that. The reason why I mention that is, on the inside, we didn't realize, and they were actually telling us, talk about a bad poker face, they were losing inside their groups. They saw that they were not going to win, and they were not going to win big. So they denied all support. One of the roles my boss actually um, is a, uh, I work for a law firm, very respected guy, knows personally current and former Florida Supreme Court justices, 11th Circuit Court of Appeal justices. He actually starts calling some of them because Equality Florida says, we would love to get some big name editorials. Gerald Kogan, former Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court, calls back and says, yeah, sorry, Roy, tell Don, he's gonna win, he doesn't need me, we don't, we'd love to help, but there's no point. There's literally no point. And that was the one where they're literally saying, and we're going, what's going on? Everybody believed, but inside, they didn't. At one point, and this was a joke among the couples, because like I said, every time a state passes something or uh, something comes out, we get a phone call, hey, Don, George, can you meet, this is NBC, can you meet us, we need you to get a comment. South Carolina, South Carolina? How the hell did South Carolina get ahead of Florida? We're like laughing, going, something is going on here, so we actually realize that. It's also during this period in which three Republican attorney generals Drop the thing. They're literally laying down their swords and saying, "We're not fighting anymore," and we're uh, Pam Bondi keeps going. The win. The win comes in two parts. Um, this is actually the Al Capone courtroom. You can't see vaulted ceilings. It's about almost three stories in there. So Shannon and Kate celebrate the win. Here is us. It's actually uh, later. This is not. Uh, these photos are actually taken on the January 5th, 2015. On July 25th, Judge Sarah Zay, Miami Dade Circuit Court Judge Sarah Sable strikes down Florida's ban on marriage for same sex couples and orders Miami Dade County to allow same sex couples to marry. She stays her decision pending uh, appeal. She lifts that stay on January 5th, 2015, and that was because there was the other case I mentioned, the feds. The feds were going to make it, uh, the judge said, unless, uh, I forget exactly what, it's a complicated, unless this happens, it's going to go into effect January 6th. Sarah says, not so fast, I went first, let's let these guys go. So um, this is actually the day of January 5th, in which uh, the stay is lifted and they allow Kathy and Carl get married in these dresses here, Jeff and Todd get married in those suits there. They're actually... Kathy and Carla are the first couple in Florida. Uh, uh, Todd, they were the second couple. George and I actually were going to be the first couple when we were back in July and they had us organize it. We actually got involved, because of course we're so late. Calls Ruth Shack and sees if she will do our wedding. 
which was actually supposed to be a whole uh, media thing. Once again, to get attention for it. George and I were so exhausted by that time, we go, I don't care. We get married in March. <laughs> Screw it. We're tired. But here we are. Actually, this, this photo is actually gone. And this is our original, you see here, that's our actual uh, first application to marry. This is the inside joke, and this is where we're at there. Told you, Sarah rules July 25th that this is happening. We've covered this tsunami. Oh, it's happening. <laughs> Literally, everybody knows this is coming. As you can see here, on our application, they have to scratch out the bride part and put spouse. There was a spirited debate between George and I as we're filling out this <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you, I think who's going to be the bride. <laughs> Let's just say of the two, I'm the nicer one. <laughs> That's how that ended. And what's actually cute is, and I have to show you this one. So I'm actually on the application, scratch out, it's spouse. It is both spouses to get there now. I want you to show you this. Okay, y'all caught on, right? Where is it? This is our marriage certificate. I had to order a copy to get some paperwork done and what I needed to show the marriage certificate in the last year. The, the, this was issued in 2020. <laughs> Did anybody catch that Governor DeSantis has misgendered me deliberately? <laughs> On official things, but I do. I, that's actually the inside joke. They get there legally. I have been wrong. Very few men can claim that. <laughs> Lastly, I'll, I'll finish on this note just ever so briefly. Uh, my uh, sadly, my husband died tragically early last year, and this is actually what happened. And I say this is the impact. We did not realize. Um, the story goes internationally. Um, and what you're looking at here, this is a lot of, not all of, a lot of the major coverage. It goes on for quite some time. Um, and uh, NBC actually refers to him when his dead, uh, one of the uh, Hispanic Americans that died uh, last year that had a significant contribution to America and the impact of that. I got well-wishers on Facebook from around the world, uh, as far away as Central Europe, and some from Africa. I have no idea how they even found out about it. Um, my husband always felt a little less than like his brother was a bit better known and a bit more famous to get the one. Uh, I like, uh, sadly, although it's in debt, it gets there. You're looking at a circulation among this and others that kind of five to six hundred million people would be the circulation or exposure. Obviously, no, they did not all read it, but that's the exposure. And I said to George, uh, or sorry, uh, Dr. Decker, I'm talking about George. Almost one in ten people on the planet. That's one of the things that I realized. And when I say that, why is it? The response is, we never thought we'd see this in our lifetime. George and I would catch ourselves crying sometimes when these things are, we cannot believe this is happening, much less that we were involved. That's what actually happens from the people that reach out to me as a result of this tragic death, is how much the symbol, they had no idea who we were, losing the symbol of somebody like that because it had a profound effect on their lives as well. And with that, I've gone quite a bit over. But I do hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, let me know. Oh gosh, you know what? I'd have to go home. Uh, you know, uh, it could be the drugs. 
Um, I don't know. Actually, what I, what I recall, and I have to go back and look at the specifics, uh, Idaho was a federal court case, and they literally went down to what judges we might get. And some of that's in the news today with some of the issues today. Um, but I do not recall what it was about Idaho. The Alabama thing really threw me off. Uh, I'm probably, oh, you know, yeah. Like, why? Why? Uh, part, part of the strategy was the media things that we were doing, because the act of putting a case in there, that was part of the strategy, the act of putting a case forces you in the newspaper, which forces something that some people don't want to see in front of their face, and this is how the needle moved. I mentioned during the time we were a little bit underwater. We were about 45% approval. We get to 60% approval after this and the stuff that we're doing. And keep in mind, there were other couples. We were not the only ones, but we were the ones that definitely, they said at the time, were suddenly too telegenic, I guess, nationally, because we were doing MSNBC, actual CNN, all of the other ones for that. It moves the needle for them, but I think that answers. Oh. For midterm, I'm in Dr. Becker's LGBTQ politics, and for midterm this semester, we had to brief a Supreme Court case that dealt with LGBTQ politics. I happen to pick one that comes very close on the heels here. It's the next year's of Burkefeld versus Hodges. What the question that I have, because you, you talk about tsunami that's that's sweeping through the nation at this point. It was weird because it wasn't just a Bergfeld versus Hodges, it was actually 16 different um, petitioners originally, and on appeal, they all got, I thought it was weird that they all got thrown together in the Sixth cir Circuit there, uh, Court of Appeals, all together into one little case. Listening to what you're saying, I wonder, if, in your opinion, maybe that's something out of desperation at that point, because they see the writing on the wall and they're trying to get Oh, a lot of that was going on, and I cannot speak definitively or authoritatively, but yes, that was something that was going on. 2014 um, is such a tumultuous year in terms of the media, and as I said, that was the point they get there. We didn't realize, and I said, inside it, the gay rights organizations, the national ones, they are not getting what's happening, but that is literally what's happening. And Everybody's operating autonomously, and they're not. And even the polls are coming out, but nobody can get. Things are changing so fast in that year that literally none of the players can track what the heck's going on. So, um, but as you said before, or, or as I did with the, the other couple, the other couples, and the other thing, yeah, nobody's also in charge. Nobody's in charge. There are literally something you wouldn't believe. You'd think it was, a, it was an organized media campaign. I, I should say that. There was also some real shoestring, holy crap, get out there. I mean, one time we're having dinner and we actually go out in the parking lot and do an interview at one point. I said, it's 50 times it goes on. Um, but no, there was not, this is not a top down thing. And you couldn't organic. really stop other groups. Yeah, very organic. Yeah, and I guess kind of going off that, do you think that it would have been more expedient to have a more mm, nationally organized legal strategy? Or do you feel like the grassroots kind of strategy is most effective? This was a nationally orchestrated. It was incredibly well thought through. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to face the reality that, uh, that, you, that you don't have control in a democracy, mm -hmm. so anybody can do what they want. I mean, one of the other ones, which we had to do a more than mirror, two bartenders down in Key West went down to the courthouse and applied and started another case mm -hmm. in the middle of our case. This is going on all over the country. Mm -hmm. So you have no control over that. Um, what they did have control over was we were supposed to create the illusion that this was all a part of the plan. Mm. So we do fold it in, and like I said, we're doing international media, which I thought, what, I don't get it. They're looking ahead. Yes, Dean? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I was just going to point out that you, know, you focus a lot on public opinion and how uh, your goal was to get that shifted or your role was. And I think it's important to note that uh, operating principles of the Supreme Court uh, if not mandated explicitly, um, certainly they operate under the guise of, you know, public opinion 
is supposed to weigh in on the decisions. And so that was an important sort of uh, lever that you used. Absolutely. And uh, there's a little wrinkle which I did not make clear. Uh, uh, so there was a concern that the U.S. Supreme Court, I actually got called from friends of mine that were, could they do it to us? Could they do Judge Sarah Sable's ruling is entirely in the state court system of Florida, mm -hmm. so the feds, could, the, the U.S. Supreme Court could not overturn it if they wanted to. It would have no effect. Florida would remain standing. Other states would fall. Can I piggyback on Carrie's a little bit? Um, She's talking about from the ground. She's talking about from the ground up. I know when we you mentioned the AIDS movement there, and we've learned about that this semester of how decentralized it was. How would you? I mean, yes, you had a concerted media campaign that was national, but how would you like? And would you say you the 2014 was as decentralized, or how would you compare it to? 2014 was probably the closest thing to a centralized, from the gay rights perspective, I want I can speak to authoritatively, uh, was probably, even though maybe the only centralized organization, I shouldn't say that the human rights campaign would hate me for that, saying that, because they do actually do things. Um, but the vast majority of it is, is ground up, mm -hmm. come there. Uh, you have no idea how much money this took. Yeah. Yeah. Now the good news is the state of Florida foot the bill. I don't know if most of y'all know that. Mm -hmm. I did. Ah, okay. So any state, federal government violates your rights, and you I need mean, equal opportunity commission, whatever it is. If you sue the government, the United States, and you win for violation of your rights, the government has to pay your attorney's fee. For them, so actually, a lot of attorneys will take them as contingency. Uh, Kate Kendall was no dummy. They got millions out of the states they sued to pay for all of the staff and salary. It wasn't a freebie; it was a payback. Mm -hmm. So it was actually free for them to do it, and that's part of what, like Lambda Legal's entire structure. I'm going to go on about that for a second. They make money solely from suing. ACLU, huge asset. They fundraise as well, but because they do more than just lawsuits. But that's, that's actually how you can afford to pay for so many attorneys on staff for either the right or the left. 